So it looks a little stretched, but we'll deal with that. So I'm Jonathan Rogers. I work for NASA down in uh, Clear Lake. So it took me about 30 minutes to get up here today. So it's pretty close. But uh, I work on Robonaut, which is this robot here. And this is the inside of the International Space Station. So that's our robot. Uh, and that picture was taken by uh, Don Pettit, who was an astronaut on board uh, a year and a half ago. So before we start talking about that, let me tell you about uh, who I am. So I, I did first robotics in high school, um, and I worked with the engineers from NASA. So they were our mentors, and worked with us through the six-week build process. And then uh, after that, I went off to college and interviewed for the NASA co-op program. And that's an opportunity where college students can take semesters off of school to go work in industry. So it's a great way to kind of try out your field, sort of like an internship. Um, you try out your field before you actually go. So it's really useful in finding out if it's a, a job that you're interested in. And from the uh, company's point of view, it's a way to have like an extended interview to find out you know, what kind of person you are, how hard you work, and if you're a good fit for their, their group. So it was a great thing uh, for me to do. So I did that from... Uh, 2004 to 2006, while I was in college. So it actually postpones your college graduation by about a year, but it's totally worth it because you have your foot in the door if you uh, don't really decide to work for that company. So I started full time in 2007 working with Rona, and then um, I'll kind of jump into the slides. If you guys have questions along the way, feel free to just you know interrupt. It's pretty informal for me. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, which which year of college did you, you know, start doing? So different companies at different universities have different requirements. Uh, so I went to Texas A&M up in College Station, and uh, my degree is actually aerospace engineering, even though I do mechanical work on robots now. Uh, but I interviewed, uh, I think it was my first semester, my sophomore year, and then uh, first semester of my junior year is when I actually went away from school down to work at NASA. But other folks, uh, like from Purdue University up in Indiana, will let you go off earlier. So it, it kind of depends. a and wouldn't let us go until we had completed uh, basically our sophomore year classes. So anyway, um, I brought some stuff today to talk about what we're doing with the robot on the space station. So, kind of give you an overview of it. The whole point of a robot is to develop a tool for the crew's use. So, this is a, uh, a humanoid robot that can work side by side with people. And just think about the possibilities you have there. Uh, normally, robots in industry do things that are dull, dirty, or dangerous. We call them the 3Ds. Because, you know, maybe it's a repetitive task that a human can get bored with. Maybe it's something dangerous like lifting heavy pieces of metal on an assembly line. Um, or dirty stuff like painting. So those, in an assembly plant, um, you typically have robots that do welding, painting, moving hardware, that kind of stuff. But those are very uh, well understood and known tasks. So if you're painting, you're going to do the same thing over and over and over, right? If you're on an assembly line. Now, a humanoid robot like this is able to work with the same tools that a human can use and then um, you know, work side by side with them for things that are maybe less well defined. So our goals are to help crew members, whether we're working on the space station or exploring the moon or Mars or an asteroid, wherever the mission may take us, we see things that you know, maybe don't require an astronaut's full attention. So, for example, one of the candidate tasks on space station is cleaning. Every Saturday morning, the astronauts have to clean their space station. It's just like cleaning a room. And I'm, I'm sure everybody here would love to have a robot help you do your chores. <laughs> Even, you know, people 200 miles above the Earth in the space station want that same thing. So anyway, um, we can also do potentially maintenance of things in space. So it's, it's really limitless. So this project started in uh, the late 90s. And you can see there's a whole uh, variety of robots that we've built. Um, the focus has really been on the upper body. So the torso, the head, and the arms and hands. And we've adapted lower bodies to the mission that we're going after. So if it's a, uh, a, 
planetary type of surface, maybe you have the robot riding on an ATV sort of thing. Or if you, uh, you know, need to walk around inside a habitat, they have legs. So anyway, this robot, uh, the current generation, Robot 2, was built by NASA and General Motors. We were uh, you know, looking for ways to continue developing on Robonaut, and they were also looking for folks to partner with to really advance the state of the art of robotics right now. So um, they sent some folks down. We, we decided to work uh, at JSC, and that was the, the first generation Robonaut. And here you can see the, the second generation one. So our robot has 42 different degrees of freedom which is pretty substantial. It's a big robot, weighs about 300 pounds. Wingspan is eight feet, so that's about a Yao Ming. <laughs> the, uh, the arms uh, are pretty big around, but they're smaller than what Arnold was at his prime when he was doing weightlifting. So we're like 99th percentile humanoid, but we're still human-sized. <laughs> so anyway, it's got a waist, it's got hands uh, that can use the same tools as people use. Uh, and then the, the head has three different degrees of freedom, and really the head is just a, a sensor unit. So we've got cameras and a virtual range finder, so kind of like a Microsoft Connect, stuff like that. And i got a bunch of cool videos. Soon as they'll actually run. There we go. Oh, perfect. Thank you. So not only did we want to make the robot look humanoid. We want it to move like a human does. If you are working side by side with one of your classmates here, you basically know, you know what areas to stay out of if they're working and doing things. You understand uh, a human's you know, ability to reach. So that adds a level of familiarity. And then we always need to have a little fun with the robots too. <laughs> things, we can write scripts and tasks uh, that are in a programming language that kind of looks like LabVIEW. Have you all used that at all? No. It's um, a visual programming language where you have blocks that go step by step by step. And it's really pretty simple to kind of build things and put them together. You don't have to necessarily know how to do uh, C code or Python or something like that to be able to program it. So it's pretty simple. Uh, and the other mode is where you put on virtual reality gear. You have gloves and uh, a helmet and a motion tracker, and you kind of like step into the robot. So we call that teleoperation. And that's a good way to, uh, to have the intelligence of a human operator controlling a robot that can be in a very dangerous situation. So think about in a, uh, a collapsed building or uh, like a nuclear power plant. If there was something that you needed to get to, you can't program a robot to do it. It's a real cool way to accomplish it. How much can uh, the robot like, lift or do something? Uh, let me see if Power I can that one. I might have a video on that. So it can pick up about 20 pounds. So in order to do real work, you need a robot that has a significant payload capacity, right? So uh, there are other humanoid robots out there um, that have had different focuses. So there's uh, the Azimo robot from Japan, which is a very cool machine, don't get me wrong, but it can only lift a couple of pounds. So our robot is picking up a 20-pound dumbbell there, and as you're going to see, it can hold it in the most difficult of orientations. <laughs> it's better. So when we have folks come visit us in our lab, a lot of times we'll ask them if they want to try to beat the robot at weightlifting. <laughs> we'll hit pause right there. 
<laughs> and it'll do that all day. So we've we've set up the uh, the motors and gear trains such that they won't overheat. Uh, part of it is just being able to get the heat out of the motor. So, you know, if you're running a motor, uh, it'll get hot. If, you, you know, if it gets too hot, it'll, it'll burn up the, the wiring inside. So what we do is we've got a bunch of metal around it to conduct that heat out and away, basically into the structure of the robot. So it's kind of like, a, you know, you've got a heat sink on a computer. Same, same kind of idea. Um, in certain places, we have uh, fans that help pull heat away from the electronics. Is, how is it powered by? Like, so the backpack mm -hmm. um, does all the power conversion. It, it plugs into the wall right now. So you have um, to use charge it or something? No, no, so it just, um, it has to be plugged in mm -hmm. currently, but we're working on a battery. Yeah. So we're going to have a giant lithium ion battery uh, to allow <laughs> you to walk around the inside of the space station. Yeah. Um, can't you use um, the solar energy from solar panels to charge it? Sure. So actually, um, if you think about it, the one that's on Space Station is totally solar powered. The, the station has about an acre's worth of huge solar panels that collect energy from the sun to power everything on board Space Station. So whether it's you know our robot experiment on board or the life support systems that keep oxygen flowing, it's all solar powered. So you had a question? Um, so up there it says minimum of 20 pounds, so it can more, it can do a little bit more, yeah. Uh, the, the weak point is actually the fingers. And if you think about it, that's that's where a human's weak point is, too. Your upper arm is much stronger than, than the strength of your fingers. So if we, if we hold things in a favorable orientation, we can get more. But 20 pounds is actually a, a pretty usable yeah. amount of weight. If you think about the heaviest things you would pick up on a day-to-day -day basis, it's about that, right? So, one of the big things that we focused on was dexterity. So that's the ability to use your fingers to do fine manipulation tasks. And uh, we can do about 90% of what the human hand can do. And really the limitation there is uh, how many motors we can pack inside the forearm. So we, you know, as engineers, you have to understand trades. So, for a, have y'all talked about this at all? Uh, I mean, through their projects and things. No. Okay, so, so generally, you know, you have to decide, well, if I want, in our case, this amount of dexterity in a hand, I need X number of motors. But I only have room for uh, 16. So, our, our robot has 16 motors that control the, the motion of the hands. And that's just the most that we could shove into a human size volume. So we could have done more, it would have been bigger, but we decided that the added value, that last 10% of what the human hand can do just wasn't worth the, the extra work. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is a, another good video of what, uh, what the robot's hand can do. And this is all pre-programmed. So this is the robot knowing where this knob is, reaching out to it, and trying to rotate it. You see the fingers are all working together to do that fine manipulation task. And that, that board is actually a, what we call a task panel that we have on board Space Station. And we're using the robot to control those sorts of, of uh, example buttons and switches and valves and things that are commonly used by the crew members to show that our robot can do that kind of Uh, the fingers are uh, mostly aluminum, so we'll go into our CAD software. We use a, a program called Pro Engineer, and it's you know essentially it's it's the same thing that you guys are using with like SketchUp or AutoCAD, whatever. Your SketchUp. Uh, 
where you can design a part and then create a drawing for a machinist to then take a block of metal and cut it out. Now some of them are um, rapid prototype types of materials where you actually grow the part. So think of a computer controlled like hot glue gun. So it'll layer by layer build up the part that you design. And normally those parts are out of plastic. We've got some that are done out of metal too. Oh, there's actually a really good picture of it. So this is the, the CAD of the Robust Forum. You can see all the aluminum parts that we build. The fingers, um, all four fingers are basically the same parts. We did that just to make things easier on us. Uh, you, know, you only have to design each of the bones once. And then to give the robot a sense of touch, we created um, load cells. So those are force sensors that can pick up loads in three directions and the rotation, the, the moments about those directions. So the robot can uh, you know, feel things as it's interacting with them. So it's kind of the idea of being able to reach into your pocket and feel the difference between like a nickel and a quarter. Now, one of the cool things about this robot is that we have force control. And you don't necessarily worry about all the details here, but the, the point is that we have a spring in line with each of the actuators. So we understand the characteristics of that spring. We know how strong they are. And we can look at how far that spring is moving while the robot is being controlled. And that tells us how much force each actuator is outputting. So what do you think you could do with that, with that piece of information? Go for what now? Control the robot. Mm -hmm. So what it allows us to do is understand how hard the robot is pushing on something. So I told you that we wanted to build this robot to work side by side with people. So in order to do that, you have to make sure that the robot is safe. And by giving the robot a sense of touch and a sense of uh, how much force it's outputting, we can limit that force and say, if I'm working next to somebody, only push with 20 pounds. And that's, that's a key technology to letting a 500 pound or 300 pound robot, however you know big you want to make it, work safely next to astronauts that are on board the space station. Because if they get hurt, you know, they're, they're hours away from any kind of help. What the, uh, what's this do? Is, can they talk? Actually, no. <laughs> we didn't give it any speakers. <laughs> but it can definitely, you know, post messages to the operator console. Um, we'll, we'll let the computer that runs it talk. But here's an example of limiting forces. So you saw it just did the, the strong man motion. And now uh, our project manager is going to step in the way. So the robot is still trying to do what we told it to do. But it realizes that something's wrong. And it should stop and you know, wait until whatever's in the way is out of the way. And you can do that at any point. The robot knows that it needs to wait until that stuff is out of the way before it can safely proceed. Now beyond that, we've got other safety systems on board that uh, if the robot sees a real rapid change in force, so like if it bumps into a table or uh, you quickly interrupt it, it realizes something's way wrong. It just totally shuts off. So are there sensors all over the robot? Yes. So we've got them um, in all of the joints of the arm. Uh, we've got cameras. We have uh, an infrared depth finder sort of sensor uh, inside the helmet. And you were asking me about how we program it earlier. This is a, a picture of the, the piece of software. So you can see that there's, there's blocks that move step by 
step-by-step with arrows, and we control the, the flow of the program based on input from the robot. So for example, if it sees something that it wants to grab off to the right, it'll realize I should probably grab that with my right hand. So using the, the sensor information that's available to it, we can program the robot to make decisions on its own. And it's pretty simple. Yeah? brings up a, another concern that we have to deal with. You know, on, on the Earth, uh, the atmosphere protects us from things like the solar flares. So when we made this robot to go to space station, we had to take those types of things into account. Electronics can be highly susceptible to things like solar flares. So um, here's one, it can affect the power grid, it can affect, you know, different things here on Earth. And since we're up above the atmosphere, we have to make sure that the robot won't do anything stupid if the electronics get hit. So that was really challenging. We had to add a lot of layers of programming to make sure that the robot understood if something was way wrong, it just stop. But right now, it just, it's able to see things in its environment, and if it recognizes them, it can interact with them. Uh, for example, we've got um, a drill that the robot can see. It's just a, the DeWalt drill that's kind of, uh, it's a very specific black and orange, yellowy color. The robot knows I'm looking for this specific color, and it can tell how to grab it and interact with it, and that sort of stuff. And here's a good picture of uh, the teleoperation y'all were uh, I was explaining earlier. So our operator here has gloves on that have sensors in the fingers. So as he moves his fingers, uh, the resistance of those sensors changes. And we take that, that measured resistance and map it to a motion of the fingers. So it's a really cool way to make the robot do what you're doing. You can see he's got a, a helmet on, so he sees what the cameras in the helmet see. And then there's also a motion tracker that is uh, following the position of his hand. It makes the robot do the same thing. an early picture of uh, what we wanted to do with the robot on the space station. So it's just on a, a simple uh, leg here. But later this year, we are actually going to send legs for the robot to walk around the outside of space station. So I was telling you earlier, we can add lower bodies that fit the mission that we're trying to do. So for astronauts, going outside the space station is a big deal. They've got to put suits on that protect them from the vacuum of space and the huge temperature changes inside or outside the space station. So outside station, it can be 150 degrees below zero or a couple of hundred degrees above zero. So wide temperature range, and you need to be protected from so if we have a robot on the outside space station, which is our ultimate goal for this project, you can have the robot take care of some of the simple things outside that maybe don't require a human's full attention. Uh, we also see you know, the robot as a team member. Uh, when astronauts go outside, uh, they always go in pairs of two, and that allows them to, to be safe. If somebody has a problem, which actually happened a couple weeks ago, uh, there was a water leak inside one of the astronauts' uh, spacesuits, And uh, his other crew member was able to help him get back in before it became a problem. Yeah? So, <laughs> as it shows like right there, mm -hmm. the legs feel like magnetic at the same time to the metal because like, it wasn't grabbing on with its hands. So it's got grippers. So instead of feet, it's got uh, clamps that grab onto handrails that the astronauts use to, to climb. You can kind of see it as a picture, basically. So it's pretty
pretty simple, but it has to be strong enough to support the weight of the robot as it moves around. <laughs> so we, we are working very, very hard to make sure that doesn't happen. How much does it cost to build one? So the torso, um, for just the parts, we put it about two and a half million dollars. So while I agree that sounds very expensive, um, think about if, you know, the robot did come loose somehow, or it was doing a dangerous activity, and it was broken. You know, a human could be seriously injured or killed in that situation. And while I would be rather disappointed if something happened to my robot, um, it's still not a human life. And plus, we, we've only built a few of these. If we were building them constantly, constantly we could save a lot of money. Yeah? Um, when it's in space, like, if it, if it, like, if it lost its on some on something. Uh, you know how on, on I don't know if I'm if I'm being correct, but like on, on uh, space like the shuttles, the, the things that are in space, they have the diesel these little holes that shoot out. Mm -hmm. huh? Yeah, so the the crew members have um, a rescue jetpack essentially attached to their spacesuits. So Actually, as the crew moves around the outside of space station, they're constantly tethering themselves. They've got hooks that grab on at different points on space station. And they make sure that they always have one attached. So if you're climbing across space station, you're constantly clipping on, clipping on, or moving it, going like hand over hand. But in case you know one of those fails or gets broken, they do have a cool little jetpack. It's pretty slick. <laughs> Yeah, so but we, we don't have any plans to do that for the robot. And, you know, we're, we're talking with uh, the safety folks for Space Station about, you know, do we need to be tethered as we move along, or have we designed the gripper well enough and safe enough that we are absolutely confident that it won't come loose and, you know, potentially crash into Space Station. I think I'd be looking for a good job. <laughs> When it goes out on the walk, how's it going to be powered? Is that going to be the battery? Be the battery? Yeah, so we're, we're replacing the current, you know, wall power backpack with a giant battery. It'll be pretty cool to see it walking around untethered. And then if you're interested, this is something that's kind of cool. Um, we have a simulation that's publicly available. So there's a, a new uh, software effort in the robotics community called ROS, it's Robotics Operating System. And it's essentially open source software that allows anybody on the internet to go out and basically get a free robot control system. And you can grab components that fit you know, your specific robot. So if you have uh, a robot that's got a pincher, there's something that you can grab and basically put it together to to fit your needs. And one of the products that we put out is uh, a simulator. So this is a model of the inside of space station and you can control it. And uh, what we're really looking to do with this is partner with universities. So there's a lot of great research going on on uh, grasping or path planning. So if it's walking around the outside of space station, the robot has to be able to figure out how to get from point A to B on its own. We really don't want to program every single step. So with something like this, we're going to be able to, to leverage research that folks have been doing from places all around the world. And then the robot also is on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> um, it will, we say it, but it's actually, it's our public affairs people that uh, we'll have the robot tweet from space and talk about what it's going to be doing for the day. It's, you know, it's something cool. Every now and then they'll do um, uh, sessions with classes. So um, I've done uh, sit-downs where, you know, we're on, we're on Twitter and we'll answer questions about how the robot works. So it's, you know, it's 
being able to do something like this, but with a school that's about a mile away. That's, that's cool stuff. How am I doing on time? Oh, you're fine. Good? Okay. And then some of the other things that I want to show you are spin-offs. So we've got this really cool robot that does a bunch of things. But, you know, as, as we said earlier, it's kind of expensive, and uh, it's a big robot. So what can we do with the technology and the, the skills that we've developed with this robot to, um, to more easily and quickly help people? So one of those things is what we call RoboFlow. So we took the same motors and gear train out of the robot's forearm and applied it to a glove that you can actually wear. So it actually is able to help you uh, grasp things more firmly or more easily. So uh, you can control it such that um, if you're wanting to hold on to a device, well, let me explain this real quick. So, our, our colleagues at GM are looking for ways to make uh, the people on their assembly line more comfortable. So, they do the same thing all day, every day. And the problem you can encounter there is repetitive stress injuries, things like carpal tunnel. And uh, when, when people on assembly lines are hurt, it leads to them not being able to do their job as well and that leads to a, a poor product. So what we're trying to do with this robo glove is reduce carpal tunnel injuries. So I want you to make a fist, and you feel how your tendons tension up inside your wrist. Now if you try to move that around while you're making a fist, you feel there's a lot of strain in there, right? So think about doing that all day, every day. That's gonna hurt you, right? So if you have the robotic glove that's able to to help you close your fingers and your tendons are relaxed, you can move around and do things much more easily, right? So one of the challenging things is putting glass inside car doors. So this is a little piece of glass and the robot is actually holding on to it right now. And the human operator can move around much more easily. So that's something pretty cool. Our, uh, our partners at the GM are testing this out right now, and we think it's a really cool way to get something that we learned building the robot out into the real world much faster. Yeah? So how does it, does it, does it amplify their movement? Like, how, how do they? So it kind of follows along. There's a, uh, a force sensor in the fingertips. So when you grab onto something, uh, the little controller board uh, will uh, trigger the motors. And then the first generation, we actually were using uh, an Arduino derivative controller. So the stuff you guys are doing today is very, very relevant. And then one of the cooler things that we've come up with is an exoskeleton. So I mean, this, if you haven't figured it out by now, piece by piece we are building the Iron Man suit. <laughs> 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 so um, this is a wearable robot, you know, just like the glove. And what we're really looking to do here on Earth is help people uh, that have uh, injuries where they can't move their legs or maybe aren't uh, strong enough. So if you think about people with muscular dystrophy, things like that, where they just they can move but maybe don't have the strength to move well, this is a huge payoff. So it's basically um, the arm actuators you know, repackaged into something that you wear on your legs. And then for... Um, for NASA, what, we interest, what we're interested in doing with it is letting astronauts wear it. So in space, you're weightless, right? So the human body is conditioned to you know, always be supporting your weight, reacting, you know, working against gravity to do things. And over the course of like a six-month stay on space station, astronauts typically lose a lot of bone density and uh, muscle mass. So when they come back, they have to spend a lot of time, basically in rehabilitation, learning how to use those muscles again and build them up. So to try to combat that, onboard space station, there are huge exercise devices uh, that you know, let them do leg lifts and bench presses and all these different things to try to maintain muscle mass. Because as we move further and further away from Earth, as we try to explore the solar system, your trips are going to get longer and longer. 
And eventually, when you land on Mars, you're going to want to be able to get out and walk around, right? You don't want to just kind of sit there and look out the window, but this is cool. <laughs> so if the astronauts are wearing a device like this along the way, that's instead of helping them, resisting them, they have to spend less time exercising, and this is a pretty small device. You don't have to send a huge thousand pounds of exercise equipment along. So we think that's a pretty cool thing to do. Yeah? Um, now that you mentioned uh, going to Mars, mm -hmm. is it true the fact that the um, NASA is planning in the year 2020 to send a spaceship off to Mars? With so maybe in 2020. So we're, we're thinking mid-2030s right now. And like there's no return, correct? Oh, so I know what you're talking about. Uh, so that is not NASA that's doing it. That's a privately funded venture that is, is looking at the possibility of sending folks on a one-way trip to Mars, which is which is an interesting moral issue, right? I mean, yeah, here's my return. Would you would you want to go knowing that you're not coming back? No, you know that's that's where I am. I kind of like it better. <laughs> Mars is cool, but I think it's a tourist destination. So that's it, just moving on its own. And then another cool thing is that you can have a, uh, a computer connected to it, and you can monitor the movements. And uh, this gentleman is a paraplegic. Uh, we're working with a group in Florida who uh, is interested in using this for rehabilitation purposes. So uh, I believe he hadn't, he hadn't walked in years. And walking is important. This is an astronaut who flew on one of the last shuttle missions. He was kind of evaluating it for us from a, you know, an astronaut's perspective. You know, is this something you should be interested in? But back to the, the gentleman who had walked in years, you can see that we have support things helping hold him up, and he's still got his crutches. But the, the physical benefits of just standing upright and allowing your blood to flow and uh, some movement are astounding. We would certainly like to. So right now, you know, he's supporting some of his weight, and then the, the robot is helping support some of it too. So anyway, I got a few more minutes, I think, for, for questions and stuff. train the, the machine that's reading the brain waves to understand what you mean. Uh, there have been groups uh, that have done that with robot arms. There was a, a video recently uh, using a German robotic arm controlled by a woman who was uh, a quadriplegic. You know, she couldn't move her arms or her legs uh, in a wheelchair. And she just thought about having the robot reach out, grab a drink, it was there on a table, like a, uh, a bottle, and bring it to her mouth to take a sip. It, it's outstanding. I mean, to think that the technology exists. 
exist. But that, you know, that I believe was embedded in her brain. So there was surgery required to plant the electrodes and things. So it may not be the right thing for, for everybody, but you know, it's definitely something we're looking at. So any other NASA questions? Robotics questions. Robotics. A lot of your robots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've always been fuzzy on, so we call it a humanoid. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've always been fuzzy on, you know, what's the real difference between an android and a humanoid? Anything else? We're, uh, we have a, a group of us working on a, a new robot. It's taking what we learned in robot and applying it to um, a DARPA Grand Challenge. So that's, uh, DARPA is the Defense Department's R&D group, and these are folks that are thinking years and years and years in the future, and are willing to do competitions to really spur development. So we've got a group working to build a disaster recovery robot right now. And this idea came out of the uh, recovery efforts for the, the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster. Remember a few years ago there was the earthquake in Japan that took out the nuclear power plant? And the recovery folks, you know, looked around the world for robots that could help them go in, uh, one, assess what's going on, how bad is it really, and then two, try to change that. So, you know, were there valves or switches or things that need to be uh, actuated to try to get the, the plant in a safe configuration? And those technologies just didn't exist. So right now there's groups around the world working on this challenge to build a robot that can walk into a hazardous environment and you know look for people that need to get out or uh, try to turn off you know a, a nuclear reactor that's malfunctioning. So things like that uh, are definitely coming down the pipe. Any other questions? Trying to see if I got any other cool videos for you. Uh, how long did it take to make the robot? So our group really likes doing quick projects. Mm -hmm. So NASA, in in some people's opinions, has um, a tendency to get into what they call analysis paralysis, where we'll just keep running the numbers on a problem. And in some cases, that's correct, you know, because if you have a rocket that costs a billion dollars, you want to get it yeah. right. <laughs> but for us, um, we're willing to quickly develop an idea and build on it. And, you know, maybe we'll get to the 80% the solution the first time around and then tweak it to get what we really want. So within uh, seven months, we had the first arm for Robin Up. So it was an arm and a hand. And then within 18 months, we had the whole robot. So we we enjoy the challenge of moving very quickly, you know, taking off on an idea and just running it. And I'll tell you straight up, we didn't get it right the first time. So as we've you know continued building robots, we've made improvements along the way to try to really make it better. So right now we have uh, eight robot two units running around. So there's, there's one in our lab that we use for task development and demos. And you know, folks come see us, we'll show them. The robot actually shake your hand. Cool. <laughs> um, this is Unit B on the space station. Um, and then we have six more that are used for different types of development tasks. So uh, in order to safely ro operate the robot on space station, we have to thoroughly check out everything that we do on an exact copy on the ground before we ever think about sending the new software up. So that allows us to, to you know, be certain that the safety systems still work when we make a software change, and you know, the robot's not going to punch an astronaut or anything like that. <laughs> punch a hole through the side of the space station. That'd be a bad day. <laughs> so we've got an exact copy, 
And then we've got um, one with our, our teammates up in, in Detroit. We sent them a robot. So they're looking at you know, ways they can help their factory workers. And then we've got four more running around that we're doing task development with and trying to make it better. So that's, that's a good question, and um, it, it sort of proves a point about engineering that really when you go to school for engineering, you are learning how to do the problem solving. So you're learning what do I need to analyze when I want to build a robot? Well, I need to look at the strength of the materials and how to build the power systems and the sensing and all that kind of stuff. So while my degree is aero, I, I use some of those skills. Like I don't use the aerodynamics and things like that that you know, I use to build planes. But uh, like the materials are all the same, so I need to know how to analyze a part. Whether it's aluminum or steel, I have to be able to decide which material to use for the, the amount of strength that I need in that part. So all the skills that you learn in engineering school are pretty close and you can translate across things. Now that said, on, on this project we have uh, mechanical engineers, which, which is really what I consider myself now. Aero is a very specialized form of mechanical, in all honesty. Um, uh, we've got mechanical engineers, we have electrical engineers who design all the electronics and sensors and bring them together to actually you know, make a finger move or an arm move. And then we have computer engineers and software engineers who write the, uh, the code actually make the robot do what we want to do. We've got a, a very diversified team to, uh, to help us build something like this. I remember earlier you said you uh, you wanted the uh, robot to make decisions on its own, like how to get from point A to point B, how, how, mm -hmm. do, you do, how do you do that? So that's actually a topic that's, that's really hot in robotics research right now, is how do you design a robot that can be dropped in a a situation and immediately know where it is and how to get to where it needs to be. So there's some cool technologies out there that um, are using things like the Microsoft Connect. Have you seen one of those? That's kind of a motion tracker thing. So instead of using it to do motion tracking, it can survey the environment in front of it. And for us, we'll be walking on the outside of the space station where there's handrails. So we'll, uh, we'll need to train the robot on how to uh, identify those handrails and how to get from A to B. So there's a lot of work going on in path planning, and that's relevant for uh, you know a robot that we want to climb or across the outside of space station. But think about a, a robotic car. Uh, Google has been working on that with uh, some researchers at Stanford, and they have lasers and things that can sense like a rock in front of it and realize I need to drive around that. So, at the high level, you know, what you want to do is pretty simple, but the implementation is pretty hard. The robot has to understand, well, I'm this big and this gap is only this big, I can't go that way. Is that kind of, yeah. it's, it's, it's difficult, <laughs> is the real answer. Any last questions? personal decision. Um, I had the opportunity, when I was graduating from college, uh, I had a, a job offer with NASA. And I decided to take it because um, at that point the economy was kind of recovering from the, the first recession in the early 2000s. And, you know, I saw a job, I was going to take it. And I was kind of tired of school too. <laughs> but um, my, my roommate, you know, has stayed at A&M, and he's wrapping up his doctorate right now. So it's it's a personal decision. You have to decide, you know, what your your educational goals are, and what you want to do. I mean, um, there are certain things at work that I would be better equipped to do if I had a master's degree. But at a certain point, you know, you get enough on the job experience.